morning. It's 8.30. It's time for our service to begin. Would you stand with me? We'll sing this old hymn, the battle hymn of the republic. Oh, my God bless America. We will sing. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is cleansing out the dead. Never sound retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before the judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to ask and be jubilant, my feet. Gracious Father, thank you for this day to worship you and to seek your face. And we do ask, Lord, for your blessing upon us and upon our country and upon your people who are called by your name.
Guide us and lead us as you will today, Father, and help us to hear your voice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome in Jesus' name. You guys can be seated. Well, um, a couple things. Uh, after church, uh, the second service today, we're going to have a, a potluck and barbecue, and uh, looking forward to having some burgers and stuff and celebrating the 4th of July. You know, we, uh, we celebrate our independence, and, uh, and it's given to us by God, but we're not really so independent. Uh, we are very dependent on him, and so we celebrate that just as much, and so uh, kind of cool. Uh, next uh, Tuesday evening at uh, 6 o'clock, July 13th, we're going to start the uh, uh, men's study, uh, Living by the Book, and I encourage you guys to, I think there's a sign up out there, but there's also books and stuff. The books are 30 bucks for the set, and we're going to work through that and looking forward to it. And then on uh, Saturday, July 17th, we've got a, a, a memorial for Grandma Carmela uh, Folk, and it'll start off at the uh, um, Colonial Mortuary, uh, Walton's Colonial Mort Mortuary up uptown there on Gay Street, and then uh, we'll do the reception part of it here at church, and so you're all invited to that. It starts at 10 o'clock. And then that evening, uh, July 17th, will be the Single Women's Fellowship dinner here at 4 o'clock. And there's a sign up on the counter for that. And then uh, <clears throat> on uh, July 24th, we've got the men's breakfast coming up, uh, 8.30 to 10.30, and I encourage you guys all to come to that. It's very edifying, and it's good fellowship. And then we've got the uh, one-day women's conference coming up on the 11th, or September 11th, that's a few months away. Uh, at Calvary, uh, Little Country Church in Reading. And so the registration will open up in August, so you get a little time to think about it. And then uh, some of the ladies are doing the quilt squares for the babies. And so uh, if you need one of those, talk to uh, Chris when she's here or Grace, and I'll get you uh, squared away. <laughs> I like saying that. And then um, <laughs> a couple things. I feel like I'm a huckster up here with all this stuff I'm going to be <laughs> giving to you. But uh, we got the latest version of Calvary Chapel Magazine. And so I encourage you guys to grab a copy of that. And it really just uh, lays out a lot of the missionary endeavors and stuff uh, through Calvary Chapel. And uh, this particular issue is about raising up the next generation. And so always an important topic. And then um, uh, almost the last thing I'll mention is I'm really kind of plugging this book, Irresistible Revolution. Uh, it is a, a, an education on Marxism in our own country today and how uh, socialism is really a wave that's being promoted uh, within the government, and uh, and so I really encourage you guys to, to get this book and uh, and check it out. I think it's like 18 or 20 bucks, but uh, it's a good read. And then uh, the last thing I'll mention is that uh, our Israel tour is back on for uh, uh, April of 2022, and uh, according to our travel agent, it uh, should be a coast clear by then and working on it, but uh, you know, uh, going to Israel is a life-changing trip, and you you see and view your Bible through the lens of what you've seen and experienced in Israel. And those that have been there can testify to that. And so I encourage you to pray about coming. Uh, the first time I came or went to Israel, I didn't have two nickels to put together. Uh, but it's amazing when you start praying about stuff, how God provides. And so uh, don't let uh, the finances necessarily be the, the dictating factor. It's whether God actually wants you to go or not. That's what's really important. And so uh, I encourage you guys to pray about that. Father God, we thank you for bringing us here today. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to worship you. Uh, we thank you, Father, for the tithes and the offerings and the provision that you've made for our fellowship. And help us, Lord, to be good stewards of it. Help us to use it in a way that pleases you to further the gospel and to make your name famous. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue to worship. Blessing. Oh. 
attitude, let's worship him.
sing this old hymn. It's a short one. We'll go through it. He looked beyond my fault and saw my need. <laughs> the title says it all. And he did it all. He saw the mess I was. He said, I, I can fix that. 
at us this morning, Lord. Help us to appreciate your word all the more. Help us to, to hear you correctly and to, to walk in your ways. And so lead us and guide us by your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. You guys can be seated. Well, as we're going through the fundamentals of the faith, and I've you know really been having fun with the, uh, the, the fun part, uh, you know, talking about having fun, and then obviously uh, trying to engage your minds mentally, and then uh, that we'd be in agreement. But I thought about adding in another part of that, uh, the duh. Like, <laughs> like duh, you know, because we're, we're going through some, honestly, some, some very basic kind of simple things. And, and I don't apologize for that. I think it's good to do that. But there's some things you might be sitting back, of course, well, I know that. But uh, knowing it and doing it sometimes are different things. And so that's part of the whole process here. But our memory verse for, uh, for last week was Philippians chapter 4, uh, verses 6 and 7. It says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, in, in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your request known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And I love that. that uh, that's, that's how you keep your mind is being by connected to God. Otherwise, uh, your mind gets away from you, and they call that being crazy. Anyway, uh, but next week's verse, or this week's verse, is Psalm 119, verse 105. And it's very simple. Many of you probably already know it. Uh, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And it truly is. God's word leads us and guides us, and we need it so much. And so uh, it's a great verse to memorize and, and uh, just to, to tuck away in your heart there. It'll, it'll come out at the right time. Thus far in our study, uh, we've gone through uh, a study on salvation and repentance and worship last week on prayer, and now we're going to start into a series of studies actually on God's Word. Uh, God's Word is obviously central to our faith in so many ways, and you know, when I, when I talk with a new believer, actually when I talk with seasoned saints as well, uh, my exhortation to them very often is just to get into your Bible, to read the Word, to, 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 to put that time aside to spend time with the Lord reading the Bible, and obviously to pray, uh, to be in fellowship. Um, yeah, to be in fellowship, go to church, uh, and, and to testify, to tell people about your faith, to tell people what you've done, and, uh, and to, to glorify God in that process, but also to find a way to serve the Lord. You know, and, and again, whether it's in church directly, uh, in children's ministry radio, we need help with those things. Uh, but there's lots of ways to serve the Lord, and so I encourage you to find a way uh, to do that. But Bible study is incredibly important uh, to a Christian. And when I say Bible study, uh, and, and I mean a couple different things. I mean the corporate study like you're in church today. I'm glad you guys are here. I'm, I'm, in a sense, I'm preaching to the choir. But also your own personal Bible study where you're reading the Bible on your own and maybe studying it through a little bit and, and applying yourself to that. And then maybe finding a small group study. Uh, we've, uh, we're going to start the men's study here pretty quick. I encourage you guys to get into that. The women already have a study going. Uh, and then uh, we'll probably get a home fellowship going here pretty soon. We've talked about that and just looking for uh, a way to do it exactly. But anyway, the, the, there's a kind of a, a, a balance to Bible study. It's your personal reading. It's corporate study. It's, it's small group studies and stuff. And when you engage in all that, you find yourself getting a pretty good perspective and view on, on God's word. And you can ask questions and you can, you know, kibitz around a little bit, and it's a good thing. You know, when I talk to people that struggle uh, with um, different aspects of life, and I, and, and I talk to them and say, well, how are you doing to Bible reading? And a lot of times that's a real indicator uh, of where they're at as a Christian, but it's something that we can all, all improve on in different ways. But it's so fundamental, and, and not, not playing on the words there, but it really is the, just one of the basics of Christianity. We spend time in God's word. And, you know, when I talk to people about, you know, the struggles they have at times, and uh, I always quote uh, Galatians 5.16 that says that, you know, so then walk in the spirit that you would deny the lust of the flesh. But what's it look like to walk in the spirit? And, uh, and I could give you a, a composite picture, uh, what I think it is, because the Bible doesn't actually lay it out. And we're told, we're told what the fruit of the spirit is, but we're not really told what walking in the spirit looks like. But my guess would be reading God's word, Praying, going to church, being in fellowship, serving God, testifying of God. All those things. When you're doing all that, you're walking in the Spirit. And it's funny how when you walk in the Spirit, it's easier to, to deny the lust of the flesh. And so an exhortation there for that. But um, we're going to go over, as we, as we look at uh, the centrality of God's Word or the importance of Scripture just in general, we're going to take it in five 
parts. The first part is really the centrality of Scripture and the importance of God's Word in the life of a believer. But then we're going to get into another study as well on what's referred to as the canon of Scripture. How did we get the Bible? That's a, a fascinating subject. Then the third thing is, can we trust the Bible? We'll talk about some of the proofs and things that, that uh, point to the reliability, if you will, of God's Word. And then uh, what about Bible translations? I mean, there's a, now there's a million of them. When I was uh, a young Christian, there was two or three or four that I knew of anyway. And, and now there's a plethora of Bible versions and translations and different things. And so we'll talk about that and what, I, what the best Bible is. And then uh, the last thing we'll talk about are some basic Bible study uh, practices or, or Bible study basics, getting into a little bit on Bible helps and resources and that kind of stuff and what that looks like. I don't want to make this a three-year study. It could easily be that. Uh, we're going to get through it just in a few weeks. Uh, I, want to, I want to get through it, but I don't want to rush through it. And so actually, we're going to take four studies uh, to talk about the centrality, really, of God's Word. And um, as, we, as we begin that, uh, as a believer and as a, as a baby believer, I think that God's Word is paramount in our growth and maturity. And you know, the, the word mantra, I don't really like that because it kind of it's new age mysticism and, you know, people that, you know, say things all the time. Uh, but I do say Romans ten seventeen a lot, <laughs> but it's not a mantra. It, it, it really is a refrain, if you will, or an exhortation that faith does come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You know, you, there's no mistaking that as you spend time in God's word, your faith will be strengthened. And so many Christians struggle with their faith. And it's, in a sense, my mind anyway, almost a needless self-inflicted struggle because there's a cure for it that we can readily take, you know, uh, apprehend, if you will, and, and take advantage of, and that's just getting into God's word. Jesus tells us in, in, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, that it's written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We have to be fed. And, and that, that's what I tell people, like new believers especially, that, you know, go find yourself a Bible teaching, Bible believing kind of a church that's going to feed you God's word. Remember what, what Jesus told Peter? And he said, you know, feed my sheep. You know, tend to them. But how do you tend to them? By feeding them God's word. And, and so it's so important that we partake of God's word. And, and important enough for Peter to re reiterate the same thing. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, Peter says, As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. And, you know, God's word is really just kind of, you know, basic, simple Simon kind of stuff for the most part. But it's so necessary for us to grow. But the point is that we grow, that we don't stay or remain in an infantile state as a believer, as a Christian, that, that we need to you know, mature and go on to, to meteor, weightier kinds of things, if you will. And, and so, again, God's word is the, the pure milk of the word helps us grow. Because of this, the Apostle Paul exhorted Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13. He said, till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. And, and again, Paul, you know, the apostle, the, 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 the pastor to pastors, if you will, is teaching this young pastor basic stuff. As a pastor, do you think, I know I should read my Bible? So when someone walks up to me and goes, hey, Mike, you got to read your Bible. I go, duh. <laughs> fundamentals but no of course yes and, and I, I would receive that exhortation but paul has given that exact same exhortation to this young pastor called timothy say hey dude stick to the basics make sure that you that you give attention to reading spend time in the scriptures i have found that when i spend time with people like as someone's a carpenter it's funny you learn carpentry i, I spend i spend time with people that are good at, at plumbing. I think about the trades in my own mind, but I made, I made it a point earlier in my Christian walk and even now to spend time with Christians because iron sharpens iron. And I want to be a better Christian, so I hang out with stronger Christians. <laughs> and, and I make it a point to be in fellowship. And my conversations are about the Lord. But here Paul is telling Timothy, give attention to reading, to exhortation. What's that mean? To exhort, to encourage others to read to encourage, encourage and to exhort others to a stronger faith. And then he says to doctrine, pay attention to doctrine. Doctrine is simply teaching. And I found that the, the, the majority of my teaching is not actually from this pulpit. The, the, the majority of my teaching is spent over at Joe's Coffee Shop or at Courthouse Cafe or at the park or at the pool or different places 
and you, you're talking to people about just basic stuff about the Bible, and you get in these conversations, and they just kind of, it's like a couple of seagulls wrestling over a french fry, right? They just start rolling around and, and going somewhere, and, and pretty quick, the conversation just rolls around, and, and that's what you're talking about, and it's, it's instructive, because we're, we're, oh yeah, does it really say that? You dig through the Bible and find it. But that doctrine, that teaching is so important that we understand the Bible correctly, and then learn how to correctly apply it to our lives. And so Paul's exhorting Timothy, and that's why, again, as he writes the second letter to Timothy there in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, he says, study to show yourself approved unto God, a worker that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The only way you can rightly divide the word of truth, honestly, is to examine it carefully. You, you can't be flippant about God's word. I've heard so many people at times misquote God's word you know, in, their, in their zeal or they're trying to explain a point or something like that. And, and, and as they misquote it, they can't actually... They can't actually divide it correctly when they're, they don't understand it themselves to begin with. So we, we got to make sure that we're, we're, we're dealing with the real McCoy, so to speak. This is what it actually says, and then this is what it actually means. And so the exhortation to study, knowing, okay, that, that it's all true. Paul tells us in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. But again, it's that all scripture is inspired, not just parts of it. There's, there's groups of people out there, men that think that they're real smart, that have gone through the Bible. Well, Jesus really said this, but he didn't really say that. And they're like, well, who are you to say that? <laughs> you, know? you know, people that would edit God's word. And all scripture, okay, is given by inspiration of God. It's God-breathed. And it says here that it's profitable. I mean, I mean, there's benefit to it for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness. I like the way that uh, Warren Wiersbe breaks it down. He says that doctrine is what is right. And then he says that reproof is what's wrong. And correction is how to get right. And then uh, uh, instruction and in righteousness is how to stay right. And, and that's pretty good because... Again, apart from God's word, we seem to stray away. Now, somewhere in our Christian walk, we have to come to the conclusion, preferably as early or as soon as possible, that, that God's word would be the final authority in our life. That, that, that God's word uh, would be the final uh, and absolute authority, really, in our life. And there, there's a lot of Christians that they, they look at God's word and it's a, you know, it's, it's a nice book. It's, it's a book of wisdom. But it's almost like a smorgasbord, kind of pick and choose. And I was taught early on as a, as a fairly new Christian that I, I needed to allow God's word to be that final authority in my life. And, and if God's word says to do something, I, I, I try to do it by the grace of God. If God's word says to not do something, then by the grace of God, again, Lord, help me not to do those things. But that his word would have final sway. And, and if I've got to make a decision, that somehow God's word would come into play in that decision. There's some of the pastors that I've really admired in my Christian walk who were the guys that knew how to take the life's issues, the, the word problems of life, and somehow bring a, a passage or a scripture to play that, that sheds wisdom and understanding about the situation that I'm going through, learning how to apply God's word to my life. And, and, and that's what we really, really need to do, and then to let God's word be that final authority. And, and if God's word speaks anything, that it, it's true, it's right. You know, and, and if my opinion or attitude contradicts God's word in some way, one of us is wrong, <laughs> you know, and it's me. And so that God's word would be that final authority. It must be the final authority in our life. Otherwise, what are we doing? How can you say the word Lord, Lord Jesus? Well, on Sunday, you're my Lord, but Monday, you're not, you know, or in this situation, you are, but in this situation, you're not. Situational ethics. He's got to be Lord of our life all the time. And his, his word has to be the final authority in our life. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man. You know, it's not enough just to hear it, but it's the doing of it. Paul writes to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. He said, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. That's just it. I don't want to just know God's word in an intellectual sense and be able to quote it and stuff like that. 
I want it to work effectively in my heart and in my life. And for that to take place, the Word of God has to be mixed with the power of the Holy Spirit and faith working in me and all those different kinds of things, and that's going to produce a different me. That means my life's going to start to change. And I, I welcome those changes because I want to be more like him and less like me. You know, God's word is the standard by which we live and view life. We have to begin, as, it, as it's our final authority, we begin to view life through the lens of the Bible. And I, and I tell you what, as a Christian, that's the only way you're going to understand current events. When you see things going on in the Middle East, or around the world, or even politically in our country, it doesn't make sense in a, in a, in a secular way. But when you view it through the lens of God's word, all of a sudden it's like, aha, I see what's afoot here. You know, I understand what's going on. You know, the enemy's on the march. And, uh, and, and so we understand. But we can't do that apart from God's word. You know, when Paul was teaching about the resurrection of Jesus, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 13, he said, But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty or vain, and your faith also is empty. He's saying if, if Christ didn't rise from the dead, what are we doing? You know, we're pretty much, you know, wasting our time. And that's true. He's talking about the most important event that's recorded in the Bible, the most important event, I think, in all of mankind, all of history, is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's the centrality, if you will, uh, of our faith, and, and everything hinges on that. And so the Bible obviously describes that, you know, in different ways. But I tell you what, Paul says if that's not true, then we're, we're toast, it's a waste of time. But if anything else in the Bible isn't true, it's the same, same thing. Because if, if God's word is inspired and God-breathed, then it has to be without error. It has to be something that, you know, it doesn't just apply to the resurrection, it applies to the whole Bible. If, if part of the Bible is not true, then why should we believe the rest of it or any of it? And so we believe that the Bible in its original manuscripts is absolutely true and infallible and without error. Now, we no longer have any of those manuscripts. We have copies of copies and translations of those copies, and there have been times when there have been minor translational or copyist errors, which have been identified through the years, but very few, and they're well known. But in the original manuscripts, they're perfect because they were God-breathed. The Bible has withstood centuries of criticism and challenges and attack, but it's still here. It's still changing people's lives, and we'll address this more as we get on. But I'm blown away by the power of God's word. I mean, I tried to stop doing some of the things that I knew I was doing that were wrong, and I, like a dog going back to its vomit, like a heroin addict going back to the needle, all these different things. I kept doing the same stupid things over and over and over again. And my partner and I would say, you know what, we've got to turn over a new leaf and, and, and do it different because we're messing up. And we kept doing it. It wasn't until I, came, I became a believer. It wasn't until I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior and began to partake of God's word that things really began to change. And so the, the, the talk about how prayer changes things, I'll tell you what, God's word changes things. There's power in his word. And our faith is dependent on, upon the truthfulness or the veracity of God's word, the accuracy of God's word, and the inspiration of God's word. That it literally is God-breathed because if it's not, then our preaching is in vain, and so is our faith. Peter tells us in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, that we've not followed cunningly devised fables uh, when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. They're saying, I'm giving you a firsthand account of what I saw. And, and there's different parts of the Bible that lay that out in, in Hebrews and uh, the, the epistles of John and so forth. It, this isn't just what we heard about. We saw this with our own eyes. That, that establishes a fact. You know, Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy never came by the will of men, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. I love that, that the Holy Spirit used different men just like, it, like we would use a pen or a pencil and, and use them to record the heart of God on paper. And again, that's why we read in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete or mature, thoroughly equipped for all good works. And, and I say there's a need for discernment as well. You know, Paul uh, spoke, uh, recorded by Luke, but Paul spoke at 
in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, he said, these were more noble or more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, speaking of the Bereans, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. That's why I'm always encouraged when I see you guys with your Bibles. I, I give you references. Now and then I, I, I'll put the wrong address or I'll say it the wrong way. And invariably, one of you will come to me and say, hey, Pastor Mike, by the way, just so you know, you, you, know, you missed this part or messed it up. I'm okay with that. I, like, I, I want to be corrected. But what I, what I appreciate is the fact that you're flipping the pages with me and you're reading. You know, when we read the psalm together or when we do the, the, the reading before and you follow through the passage, you know, you're, you're, you got it. And, and you're checking it out. And that's what I, I hope for is that you're not dependent on me particularly for your faith and that you'll search it out on your own. And, and that's why they were more fair-minded. That readiness of mind was built on the assumption that God, that the word of God was truly the word of God. And, and, and it's also evident that the Brians were comparing what they were receiving, what they were hearing in a Bible study, and they were going home and, and getting out the scrolls or whatever and making sure that that's exactly what it said. And that's a good thing. We should be looking to scripture to validate our faith and practice. And what I mean is, you know, how do we live in our lives? And why do we do what we do at church? All those different kinds of things. But, you know, we're, we're, if we're going to use scripture to validate that, then the question ought to be, did Jesus do that? Did Jesus teach that? Did the early church practice it? Did Paul talk about it? Is there a scriptural basis for our belief and our practice? And there should be. I mean, there's some traditions in church that I think are cool, like, like singing the benediction at the end. You know, we, we get that from, but we get that where? From numbers. You know, we, we, we get that from scripture. And so a lot of things that we do, you may not know why we do it, but if you ever ask me, so, well, why do we stand, you know, when we read scripture? Well, because in Nehemiah chapter eight, they stood, you know, and, and so there should be a scriptural basis for the things that we do. The center of our faith and worship is Jesus himself, because Jesus is the word. In John chapter 1, verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. I love Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7, because it's, it's, it's quoting uh, uh, Psalm uh, 40, verse 7. But it says, uh, then lo, uh, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. But lo, I come in the volume. Who's, who's he talking about? He's talking about Jesus. And, uh, and I've told people that, you know, as you go through your Bible from Genesis to Revelation, chapter by chapter, book by book, you're going to find some aspect of Jesus in, in the midst of all that. I won't say every single verse, but it's pretty close, you know, and you can find Jesus in all these things. And again, uh, without faith, it's impossible to please God. God wants us to have that faith. And how's faith come? <laughs> Romans 10, 17 again, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And so it, it, it's amazing how it always kind of seems to circle back to some aspect of God's word. Jesus affirmed our need to be in God's word and to partake of it regularly. Uh, somebody uh, was teasing me a, a, a couple months ago and said, you know, how come every single study mentions food? I don't know. <laughs> but it is interesting because Jesus talks about food some. And again, I know I mentioned this earlier and I don't mind being repetitive, but Jesus said that man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And, you know, in talking about food, I like food. And I partake of food on a pretty regular basis. And, uh, and, and because of that, you can tell that I'm well-nourished. I may not be real strong, but I'm well-nourished. And, uh, but the thing is, unless you partake of God's word on a regular basis, you'll be a malnourished Christian. And, uh, you know, I've, in my life, I've been uh, very thin, uh, as a runner in high school, I, I tapped out at about 120 pounds. Uh, they wouldn't let me on the football team because they thought I'd get hurt. And uh, I was real skinny. And then I got married and I got fat. And, uh, and then, then, I, you know, then I started working out and I got in shape. And then I'm, I'm losing weight and I'm weaker than I used to be. And so I've, I've played the gamut of things. But, I, but I've learned that nutrition is a huge thing. And unless you have the right kind of nutrition, you won't even think right. And I would say the same is true of God's word. Unless we partake of his word daily. I mean, how many of you, how many of you eat every, every fourth day? None of us do. We all eat probably at least once a day, maybe twice a day, probably three or four times a day. I'm like a hobbit some night, 12 times a day. But, you know, but do I, do I partake of God's word that much? 
and I wish I did, but you know, you can squeeze it in. Uh, there's all kinds of times where you go get your tires rotated at the Les Schwab or you're, you're waiting for your coffee or your, for your food. You can just bust it out, you know, crank out half a chapter, then uh, keep reading when the food comes and, you know, finish it off, whatever. But I mean, we have opportunities to get into it if we choose to. I don't suggest reading it at red lights. That's bad. <laughs> People will honk at you. But, um, but again, we're told as newborn babes to desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. But how do babies desire milk? <laughs> I mean, it's an interesting thing to watch a little kid, you know, that, uh, that they're not happy until they get their connect. You know, they're not happy until they, 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 they're, they're being nursed or fed or whatever. Because they, they don't have the ability sometimes to communicate, hey, I'm hungry. Well, they do it by screaming and crying. But, I mean, they're not very articulate. And it's a pretty plain message to hear. But when, when they're hungry, you know it. And watch how they, when they, when they finally latch onto the bottle or whatever, man, they're not like being like real gentle and like, oh, just take a little bit at a time, man. They're, if they could, they'd swallow that whole bottle at one shot. And that's how we need to approach God's word, that we need to be eager for it and looking for it, hungry for it. You know, Jesus told his disciples, blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And so if that's what your pursuit is, God will meet you there. And it's, and it's, you know, with, with a baby that doesn't get that nourishment, what happens to them? They, they lose weight. Eventually they die if they're not fed. And, and Moses hits on this a little bit. In uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 19 and 20, I call heaven and earth as witness today against you that I have not, that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God and that you may obey his voice you may cling to him, for he is your life and the length of your days. But think about this. How can you be obedient to what you don't know? Pretty tough. You know, if a cop pulls you over for, uh, writes you a ticket for something or arrests you for something, ignorance is no excuse for the law. That's, that's actually part of the California Penal Code. Whether you know it or not, uh, just what, what, what matters is you broke the law. And it's the same thing in a certain sense with God's word. Ignorance is no excuse. We're expected to learn his word. And, and God lays that out, and so we need to get to it. On at least three different times or occasions, Paul exhorted Timothy simply to read his Bible. I gave you one of them already, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13. Till I come give attendance to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. Then later on in, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16, he says, Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, you will both save yourself and those who hear you. It's like the old adage, you know, like a, like a lifeguard can't save anybody if he doesn't know how to swim. And so we need to learn God's word so that we'll get saved. And then if we learn God's word enough to where we get saved, then we can turn that around and give it to somebody else so they can get saved. And so you, you can't help anybody. I've met some very sincere, nice people at times that say, well, you know, I'm praying for you. And I say, I appreciate that, but let me ask you, who are you praying to? Well, you know, just to the whoever's up there. <laughs> like, well, he's got a name, and, and he knows you. And if you really want your prayer to be effective, then you're going to have to direct that in the right way, but you're going to have to have that relationship with him first. And so, you know, happy thoughts and all that stuff don't really cut it. And so he says, you know, to, to Timothy, take heed to yourself, continue that, that you save yourself and those who hear you. And then, of course, 2 Timothy, again, 2.15, study. Study to show yourself approved unto God. It's not unto Mike. It's not unto the church or your denomination or anything else that's going on in life. It's We want to be approved of by God. I want his hand to rest on my shoulder. I'll be glad to see you when we get there, but I want his hand on my shoulder. <laughs> you know, well done, good and faithful servant. And so we want his approval. And you've probably heard this before, but it's been said that, that God's word will keep you from sin. And sin will keep you from God's word. It's amazing. God's word will keep you from sin if you let it. Remember our first memory verse, Psalm 119, verse 11. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. I, I, I can't think of a time when I've gone into some kind of willful transgression where God's word didn't pop up and go, don't do it, don't do it. You know, here's why, here's, you know, scripture. And, uh, and when you take heed to that, it's an awesome thing. When you don't, it's like, okay, well, I'll talk later. <laughs> but God's word nourishes us and cleanses us. You know, Jesus tells us in, in John chapter 15, verse 3, Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken to you. 
allowing God's word to wash over us and to cleanse us. God's word sanctifies us. To be sanctified means to be set apart, to be different. And if you partake of God's word, you will be different. You'll be different than what you were. So you'll be different from your old self in a certain sense. But if you continue in God's word, it'll make you different than the world around you. So much of the church is trying so hard uh, to be relevant and relational and all these different things that, you know, to, to be like the world. Hey, we're cool. Come hang out with us. But they've become like the world to do that. But what will happen is, as you engage in God's word, you'll start to go through that sanctification process where you're going to be different than the world. And the world needs us, by the way, to be different because they can't save themselves. They have no hope in anything. But if they see someone that's different, that's living their life, that a sanctified life before the Lord, that person's going to live a different kind of life. That person's going to have some hope to offer. And when they see that we're different, I, I had guys come up to me at the PD but years ago and say, you know, uh, Sarge, uh, you're, you're like way different than everybody. And they weren't saying it like I was weird because when I was a brand new Christian, they were saying I was weird. Now they're coming to me years later, your life is different. I want what you have. They didn't come to me because... My life was like their life, you know, falling apart. And so that sanctification process is important, but the sanctification process happens through God's word. In, in John chapter 17, verse 17, Jesus says, sanctify them by thy truth, thy word is truth. We become different by exposure to his word. God's word tells us where we've come from. In, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and it goes on, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, period. But it explains our origins. And you can't know where you're going or get to your destination unless you've got a starting point. So God's word gives us where, we're, where we came from. The book of Revelation tells us where we're going. And there's a lot of stuff in between all that. But, I mean, that's how we figure out what's up. And God's word describes how we can impact that final destination. Because in the book of Revelation, the Bible itself describes there's two possibilities. One is heaven being in his presence forever. The other one is hell. And we're going to go to one of those two places. And we have a choice. We have the ability to, to alter our eternity, our destination, just that way. In John chapter 3, verse 36, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. That's our choice. And, and, and God brings clarity to our lives and shows us the way that we should go. Again, our memory verse, Psalm 119, verse 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I, I love that God brings clarity to our lives. He, he, bring, he brings order out of confusion. God is not the author of confusion. And, and so God's word brings us to salvation, literally peace with God, and draws us into a personal relationship with him. The psalmist declares, we read it earlier, but I want to read it again. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, and sweeter also than honeycomb. Moreover, by them thy servant is warned, and keeping of them there is great reward. But look for a second. If, you, if your Bible's still open to what we read earlier in Psalm 19, the law of the Lord. What's the law of the Lord? That's the word of God. Look at the testimony. What's the testimony? That's, that's the word of God. The statutes, the commandment, the fear, the judgments. All these are different synonyms describing literally the word of God. Then you have that, that description of the word of God. And then it's got a, a, it'll have an adjective that follows that, a description. It, it's perfect, or it's sure, or it makes wise the simple, it's right, rejoice in the heart, all those things. But then it gives you, here's the word of God, and here's what it does. It converts the soul, makes wise the simple, rejoices the heart, enlightens the eyes, endures forever, cause and effect. What I'm getting at is that God's word is powerful, that God's word accomplishes things. It does stuff. I love that. You know, you, you don't see that in, in, in any other holy book or religious thing or whatever. You know, they're just dumb, useless idols. But our God is forever, and, he speak, and when he speaks, things happen. But regarding the sufficiency of God's word, 
I'll tell you what, the, the Bible really and literally is all that we need. There's a lot, of, a lot of people out there that will offer, you know, Christian self-help kinds of stuff or, uh, you know, Christian living or psychology or a, a, a long list of things. But literally, God tells us that his word is all that we need. It is, it is sufficient for all things. We read in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. Grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power, that's the Holy Spirit, has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. But he's given us everything we need in himself and in his word. All we got to do is dig it out and find it. Now, that's talking about the, um, the centrality of God's word. Uh, the next thing I want to get into is uh, the canon of Scripture, uh, how we got the Bible. And we're going to take this, we're going to finish this, how we'll finish out our study this morning. And then the next time we get together, we'll pick it up with how we got uh, the New Testament. But I want to uh, highlight something, uh, Halley's Bible Handbook. Uh, Pastor Chuck, that was his, his recommendation that you know, every new Christian, get a, he gave these away like hotcakes. And I've given a bunch away until, uh, you know, it's a great little commentary. Uh, it's about archaeology. It's about uh, the proofs of the Bible. But on page 741 in this book, uh, basically there's this description of how we got the Bible. And it's about a six or seven or eight page read, but it's really super informative. And I can't put it all in our study this morning, but if you want to get a better grip on how we got our Bible, that's a great passage to read. And it'll really be uh, is very clearly written. We're told in Scripture in, in 2 Peter Chapter 1, verse 21, that for, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And it's, it's interesting whether they knew it or not, the writers of the Bible were being used by the Holy Spirit to, to record things. God put it on their heart to write something down. And then they later figured out, like the rest of us did, hey, that's actually scripture. That's the word of God. And the Bible is comprised of 66 books, uh, 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament, written by 40 different authors. This is the part that gets me. Written by 40 different authors on three different continents, uh, Asia, Africa, and Europe, and over a time period of 1,500 years. And so it wasn't like written in a week, wasn't written by just like Moses, but 40 different men being moved by the Holy Spirit on three different continents over 1,500 years. They're, they're writing all this stuff, then, it, then it's, it's brought together, and it's like, wow, that is the Word of God. And all this, in, in all this, there's that consistency. You know, Chuck Missler puts it like, he describes it as an integrated message system that renders the, the primary message of, of salvation, the gospel itself, but the, the Bible, when you think about 40 different authors, think about all the controversial subjects that are covered in the Bible. I mean, today we debate about uh, homosexuality. We, we, we talk about abortion. Uh, we, we talk about a uh, myriad of things, uh, some controversial things. And there's lots of opinions on that. But you know, when you read through the Bible, when you get to all these different controversial subjects, it's one voice. It, it, it's a consistent message. There, there's no contradictions in the Bible. I love that. They're, they're, people think they find some contradictions, but through further study, they go, oh, I see it now. And, and it all works out. But you can't, if, if the, the 20 or 30 of us in this room this morning was to write a paper on any given subject, I just pick a point, and we're all to write, like, okay, you got, you know, write one page on it. We might have a couple different opinions. <laughs> we might have a diversity of thought or whatever, but it, it's almost like this whole thing was written by one author but it was 40 different men. But I would say it is one author because it's the Holy Spirit guiding each of these men to record these things, what he had put on their heart. And so the Bible is truly amazing in the sense that it survived through centuries of physical and critical attack. There's been more than one kingdom that went through and conquered Israel and said, okay, burn all the scrolls. You know, there's been countries that, have, you know, in, in Europe and other places that when they take over, burn all the Bibles. You know, you, you look at Russia that went through that. You look at China that went through that. Communist nations that were trying to make the government God. And yet, there's Bibles all over the place. 
and people are smuggling Bibles into those places. And, and it's an amazing thing that, that through all those different kinds of attack, God's word has prevailed. It's been preserved. That's a cool thing. God is able to preserve his word and has done so in spite of all the different attacks that have come upon it. And the Bible has proven itself to be both scientifically and historically accurate, even though it's not primarily a scientific or historical book. But you look at the word history, his story. It's all about him. And one way or the other, even in the, the whole world's going to wrap up in one day, and everyone's going to stand before who? And confess whose name? That he is Lord? History will be complete at that point. And so it's all about him. Now, the word canon literally means cane or measuring rod. And it, and it came to be used as the name of uh, the list of the books that were recognized as being genuine, uh, original, inspired, author the authoritative word of God, the rule of faith. I had a discussion with somebody the other day about uh, the apocryphal books or different books that claimed. And, and over the years, there have been people that have tried to write things and make it, quote, unquote, scripture. And again, as you go through this and, and read through uh, how we got the Bible, it had to be internally consistent, no contradictions. It had to be externally con consistent, no contradictions. And, and, and they had different ways of validating it. And so it's really cool that the, as they go through that process. Now, a lot, a lot of other books that, that claim to be scripture were, were tossed out because they plainly weren't. There were, there were contradictions or different things that happened there that were unbiblical. And so the canon of scripture is the rule of faith, if you will. And even as in history, God began to form, quote unquote, the book that would be the revelation of himself to mankind. Understand that God has revealed himself to us in different ways. There is general revelation, okay, which is nature and creation. You can look at the stars at night and kind of go, wow, what, what a huge coincidence. You know, but you see how the planets move and everything happens. And like we're, we're just the right distance from the sun, but not too far away, tilted the right way, all these different things that, that through creation we can see. You, you, you watch, look at the, the birth of a baby. You look at the human body and the healing process and you get down to all these different levels of things and you realize, you know what, this is a, an incredible design. There must be a designer. And so God has revealed himself in a general way through creation and, uh, and, and all that stuff. But he's revealed himself to us specifically through his word. And, and, and I'd say through Jesus because Jesus is the word and the word became flesh. And so we've been given the opportunity to, to examine his specific revelation uh, through his word. And it begins actually when God first wrote out the Ten Commandments. You know, do you realize, do you guys remember that God wrote the Ten Commandments with his own finger <laughs> on a tablet of stone? In Exodus chapter 31, verse 18, and he gave unto Moses, when he'd made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tablets of stone, uh, of testimony, uh, tables of stone written with the finger of God. <laughs> How did God's word get started? God started it by writing it in stone. <laughs> You've heard that phrase, is etched in stone. <laughs> And God's word is. Then Moses began to write things down in a book as well. In Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 24, it says, And it came to pass when Moses made an end of writing the word of his law in a book until they finished, that Moses commanded the Levites, which bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord, saying, Take this book of the law and put it in the side of, inside the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there for a witness against you. And so they made copies of that, but they put the original, if you will, in the safe or in the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, copies of that book were made. Uh, we read in, the, in regarding kings. This is in Deuteronomy, instruction to kings. In Deuteronomy 17, 18, it says, And it shall be when he sits upon his, the, the throne of his kingdom that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book uh, for the one before the priests and the Levites. Do you realize that it was a requirement for kings back in that day that when you had a king, his job was... He had to, he could just tell a scribe, you do this. The king himself had to take the, the, the law that the, the, the priests and Levites had and actually copy it out. You ever done that before? Like taking the, like written down the Gospel of John or Deuteronomy or whatever? You can't help but learn it as you do that. <laughs> I, I remember a, a, a brother one time that uh, uh, had a child in jail 
and made a deal with her. Hey, if you write out the Gospel of John and mail it to me, I'll mail you 50 bucks to put on your account. And so she did that. And then she got saved. He mailed her the 50 bucks, and she goes, what other book would you like me to write? <laughs> you know? But that's, that's how she learned the Word of God, and that's how she got saved. Pretty cool. So copies were made. Again, the, the kings wrote down these copies. Uh, Joshua added to the book in uh, Joshua chapter 24, verse 26. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God. So Joshua was adding to it. Uh, we know that Samuel wrote uh, in a book and laid it up before the Lord. In uh, 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 25, then Samuel told the people uh, the manner of the kingdom and wrote it in a book and laid it up before the Lord. Samuel's one of my heroes of the faith because Samuel, God used Samuel to bring the word of God back to Israel. And fascinating character study there. But this same book was well known some 400 years later in 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 8. It says, And Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan, the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. They lost the word of God. The Jews lost the word of God. It was stashed. It was you know, put away. And then they, they couldn't find it. You ever do that? Put something in a safe place <laughs> and then you can't find it? I've been searching for stuff for a couple of years now. That's so safe. But anyway, he says that we, we found the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan and he read it. Then Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. Now what happened when the king heard the words of the book of the law? That he tore his clothes. Because he was impacted by the word of God. You will be too. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And I tell you what, when a, sword is, when a sword is sharp and a knife is sharp, sometimes you get cut by that. So bring some band-aids with you when you read it. But he tore his clothes because he realized he'd been living his life. He'd been ruling the kingdom in ways that were not consistent with the word of God. And he tore his clothes as, as a sign of grief. And then he committed himself to getting back to God's word and honoring God's word. And, and he was a good king and he did that. But the prophets wrote books. In uh, Jeremiah chapter 36, verse 32. Then took Jeremiah another scroll and gave it to Baruch the scribe and, and son of Neriah, who wrote therein from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the book which Jehoiakim, king of Judah, had burned in the fire. And there were added besides unto them many like words. So Jeremiah is writing Ezra. In Ezra chapter 7, verse 6, this Ezra went up from Babylon, uh, and he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. And so Ezra is putting into that. Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 5. This will sound familiar. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of the people, uh, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. So they read in the book of the law of God distinctly, and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. I'm hoping this sounds familiar to you guys, because that's pretty much our MO. That's what we do. We just read God's word and try to explain it as best we can, and we move on, and trust the Holy Spirit will commit it into your heart. During the time of Jesus, these, these books were simply referred to as, quote-unquote, the scriptures, and they were used for reading and teaching pu publicly. It, uh, it was commonly regarded amongst the people as quote-unquote, the word of God. And Jesus himself frequently referred to it as such, the scriptures or the word of God. Interesting when you examine the Gospels, the issues between Jesus and the religious leaders were of interpretation and application as opposed to the validity of the text itself. Okay? They, they were in great disagreement about how they were to be applied and how it was to be received, but they never argued over the validity of the scriptures themselves. Um, in the New Testament, there are over 300 quotations from, quote, unquote, the scriptures, as we refer to the Old Testament. And, uh, and no other books are quoted in the New Testament apart from one, a single uh, quotation uh, from Enoch, uh, referred to in the book of Jude. But, but everything else is from the Old Testament in the New Testament. Uh, the, quote, unquote, scriptures were written in Hebrew. Later, when Greek became the dominant language of the day, under Ptolemy, the, one of the Seleucid kings, uh, he reigned over a fourth part of Alexander the Great's kingdom uh, after his death, but he commissioned what's referred to as the Septuagint version of the Bible uh, because prior to that, everything would have been in, in uh, Hebrew, but everybody else is speaking uh, Koine Greek, and 
hardly anybody could read the Bible. And they wanted to make it so that other people could. So uh, Ptolemy um, commissioned 70 scholars that were sent from Israel to Alexandria, Egypt. They were given the task of uh, translating the Hebrew scriptures into the Koine Greek of the, of the day. It's called the Septuagint because Septuagint means literally 70. And so 70 scholars translated the Hebrew scriptures, and it only took them 70 days. So 70 on a couple different, you know, different ways. Uh, it's not regarded as the absolute best translation. Uh, it, it's just a translation. And, uh, and so it's not uh, as authoritative as uh, some are, it seems. But the Septuagint translators reclassified the books of the Old Testament uh, according to the subject matter, taking them from 24 books and expanding it now to 39 books, uh, which has been followed by the Latin and English translators since that time. Uh, the law was five books, and it still is, but the prophets had eight books, and then it had, quote, unquote, the writings, which were 11 books, which equals 24. And then um, they switched that around a little bit. Later, the books of Samuel and Kings and Chronicles, they were all one book, but they, for whatever reason, they divided that to First and Second uh, uh, Kings, First and Second Chronicles, and First and Second Samuel before that. And so they expanded it a little bit. Uh, Ezra and Nehemiah were previously combined as one book, uh, but then they separated that into two books. Um, all the minor prophets were on one scroll, and so they were separated into, into separate distinct books. So you got the 12 minor prophets. And so, so you, you do all that, uh, and, and then each of these books were written, uh, beginning with Moses, they were at the time recognized as the inspired word of God. Uh, but basically, uh, as they do all that separating out and all that stuff, they land on 39 books. And so basically the, the same Old Testament that we recognize as the Old Testament today. Uh, the Jews and, uh, and the different denominations all recognize the Old Testament is just that, the Old Testament. And it all comes from what we refer to as the Masoretic text. We'll talk about that more in a minute. But they were, they were placed in the tabernacle, then later in the temple, uh, along with the accumulating group of sacred writings. And then over the years, copies were made as they were needed. And then during the Babylonian captivity, uh, along with burning everything else, they burned all the copies of uh, the scriptures, you know, and the, except for the ones that were kind of hidden away and, uh, and that kind of stuff. And then uh, when Ezra returned from the captivity, he reassembled the, the scattered copies and restored them as a complete set uh, to their place in the temple. Uh, the historian Josephus considers the Old Testament canon as being fixed from the days of Artaxerxes, or Cyrus, as we know him. And, uh, and, and so this is the same as the time of Ezra, uh, who was sent back to Jerusalem from Babylon. Uh, again, Jesus referred to these scriptures uh, as the word of God. And we, we talk about, like, people ask me about what Bibles and manuscripts, and we're going to get into that uh, next week. But... The Old Testament is considered what's referred to as the, the Masoretic text, okay? And all Bibles, whatever translation you've got, NIV, uh, New King James, King James, whatever, all Old, Old Testament references are to the Masoretic text. That's because the Masoretes were scribes, and they, they copied and recopied the Old Testament and, and preserved it. Remember, we talked about how they would change their robes, and every time they come, came to the word God, different things, and... And they were being very, 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 very careful. And if they made a mistake in their scroll, they, they burned it. They, they stopped right there and they started over again. And so they're very, very meticulous. And so they help maintain the scriptures. Uh, and that is the common basis for the Hebrew Bible, our, our Old Testament, which is in every version. Later, uh, in uh, 1947, when they, dis in, they discovered the, the Dead Sea Scrolls in Qumran, as they opened up these scrolls and began to examine them, uh, they were in near total agreement with the Masoretic text. There were a couple times when they, there was a, a different spelling or, or, or punctuation was just a little different, but 99.99% of the uh, Masoretic Old Testament scriptures matched up with the Dead Sea Scrolls, meaning they'd been um, copied and recopied accurately uh, through the many years. And so nobody argues about the validity of the, uh, of the Masoretic text or the Old Testament text. And so it's really cool to know that, that you can trust that. 
Uh, we've been spending, obviously, the last uh, few years working our way through the Old Testament uh, towards, uh, you know, the New Testament, obviously. And, um, and so all of our time has been spent essentially in the Masoretic text. No debate about that. When we get next week, when we start talking about how we got the New Testament, there is some more um, discussion or debate about some of those things, and we'll get into that. Um, actually, next week, um, you guys remember we were, we were praying for Roger Johnson, the pastor up at uh, Mountain Christian Fellowship in uh, Shasta Lake. He passed away, uh, sadly, uh, for us. He went to glory, and we went to his memorial last week. Uh, next week, I'm going to go teach at their church uh, because they, they've got a group of pastors coming through to teach for a little while. And so um, uh, John Truford will be teaching uh, Sunday morning. So the week after that, uh, we'll get into the second part of this study uh, where we talk about uh, how we got the scriptures, how we got the New Testament. And then um, can we trust it? You know, we'll talk about reasons why you can trust it. And so, uh, again, I think it's a, it's a great study to get into. And... Uh, the centrality of God's word. I can't encourage you guys enough. You know, my job is, you, know, you, you call me pastor, but in Greek, that means cheerleader. Go team, go. You know, and, uh, and literally, I really want to encourage you guys, read your Bible. Go home tonight. You know, think about what you learned today. Tonight before you go to bed, just spend a few minutes reading your Bible. You'd be surprised how, if you have a problem sleeping, reading your Bible for half an hour before you go to sleep, you sleep like a baby. Okay, so uh, that's my prescription. Two aspirins and a chunk of the Bible. So, Father God, thank you so much uh, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for loving us and, and for revealing yourself to us. Uh, thank you, Father, for making it plain and easy. Uh, and, Lord, we ask that you would help us just to, 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 to grow, to, to, to partake, and to be strengthened by your word. Have your way, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if you're able, let's, uh, let's stand and continue to worship God.
Gracious Father, truly you are so worthy, and Lord, we are so unworthy. And we're grateful to you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy, Lord, and your forgiveness and your kindness to us. And we ask, Lord, you would help us just to, to appreciate and to partake of what you've offered to us, Lord, and that's yourself. We love you so much, and we pray that truly you would be glorified in the lives of your servants. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless thee. The Lord bless thee. And keep thee. And keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee. And be gracious unto thee. And be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up. His countenance, His countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Well, God bless you guys. I pray that you go and you do read your Bibles and that you are immersed in His Word and that when you come out, it'll be bathed in the Lamb. God bless you guys. Have a great day. If you need prayer for any reason, come on up. We'd love to pray with you.